Okay, when, when we uh, start, if everybody could uh, uh, mute their uh, mute while we're, while we're doing that, yeah. that's okay. <laughs> okay hi everybody hello uh, hi thank, thank you for uh thanks for uh share uh joining hi. in and uh thanks that you're here and uh this is uh a, dif a different time for us usually at five and it's uh seven right now so and uh so right now we're going to go live. We're going live with uh, uh, Brendan Constantine, and and here he is. And uh, we're going to uh, start with uh, a uh, a a, a uh, PowerPoint, and uh, and then we're going to go back and forth to it. So let me uh, share that in a second. Let me share my screen. Okay, so just uh, some of my, uh, <laughs> from our friends from uh, from our group from uh, Poems and Speech. If you don't know uh, Brendan, uh, he is a poet and a uh, a teacher of poetry. And so mm -hmm. let me go. Uh, uh, Roberta is going to introduce him. Thank you. Can you see your screen? Okay. Okay. All right. Ah, thank you, Mark. Great to be here with everyone, and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Brendan Constantine and hear your conversation this evening. Um, <laughs> for those of you who may not yet have met Brendan, he's published numerous poetry books, and his works are also found in many poetry journals. In in reading or listening to Brendan's poetry, his gifts with language reveal his empathy, honesty, and humor. In addition to being a published poet, he teaches poetry and creative writing at Windward School in LA. And he's also been invited to perform his poetry throughout the United States and Europe. Uh, he conducts his poetry workshops in a variety of community settings and his workshops are very much in demand. In 2017, he was invited by speech language pathologist, Michael Beale to develop a poetry workshop for people living with aphasia. In listening to tonight's conversation, it will become clear what an inspired idea that was. Uh, we're fortunate that through Zoom, Brendan now offers workshops in a variety of settings, including aphasia centers. Tonight's conversation has much to offer in increasing our understanding of the role that poetry can play in promoting confidence, connection, and the joy of language. If you have questions or comments uh, during the, the conversation, if you wanna put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them at the end of the evening. Thanks so much, and I'll turn this back over to you, to you Mark. Okay, thank you, Robert. Uh, um, so I, I met uh, Brendan on Zoom last year, uh, last uh, year, uh, April, and uh, uh, Francie and uh, Michael uh, offered a uh, po poetry uh, workshop uh, with people that have aphasia. And if anybody knows, uh, Avi, Avia, he's uh, that he shared that, and that's how I found it. And uh, Brendan was the teacher then, so it was the first time I met him. And uh, but uh, Brendan, uh, I was very interested in everything that you were doing, but I wanted to know if we always wanted to be a helper or a teacher or a a poet or or a, an uh, artist. There we go. Um, oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Mark, for uh, for having me. Uh, it's a delight to be here with you. Uh, yeah, that's that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> and uh, as far as um, being a helper or teacher, uh, I never thought that I, you know, would end up being a, a teacher of any kind. I really didn't. That was uh, that was not something that I was aware of uh, early on. 
But I did come from uh, a very creative family. Uh, both my uh, parents are, uh, were actors. And um, when I showed up uh, in the 60s, my uh, dad was, uh, was a popular television actor and, uh, and, and also it appeared in a lot of films and Broadway. And um, my mom had stopped acting for a while to have kids, but was just putting her career back together. And uh, they put a big emphasis on the arts and creativity when they were raising both me and my sister. So that was, uh, you know, it was sort of a given that we were gonna do something creative, but uh, I wasn't sure what. And I, um, I tried a lot of things, uh, but I would tire of stuff very quickly. You know, I, I, I showed a talent for acting and I was uh, sent to acting school and it was assumed that I would follow my parents' footsteps. But uh, when that became truly, truly difficult, when I had to learn the real subtleties of that art, um, uh, I had trouble staying with it. Uh, photography, drawing, painting, all of these things really inspired me. But as soon as I had to really uh, get down and learn, uh, you know, the real, the real complexities of those arts, um, I would back off. Poetry, for some reason, is the thing that I stayed with after it became work, after it became difficult, after all the encouragement dried up, and after I was confronted with just the sheer tonnage of how much I would never learn, uh, I still uh, wanted to do that. As far as teaching, that came afterward. Um, I had been uh, writing and publishing and traveling for poetry for a while, and somebody else said, you know, you should get yourself in a classroom. Uh, and their attitude about it was very much, this is, you know, this is one of the big ways that you give back. If you, you know, if you get good at something, then you need to, you need to help other people to do it. It's not enough to just practice your art. You know, if you can be useful to somebody else, if you can help somebody else, that's, that's what you should be doing. Um, so I started teaching as a result of, you know, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, largely being embarrassed into it. Uh, and I started teaching at a high school and then, um, uh, and that was like 25 years ago at least. And, uh, uh, and it still scares me. Uh, I haven't, uh, it's, it's never gotten to a point where it's like, oh yeah, I can, I can do that with, you know, <laughs> with my with my eyes crossed, so to speak, I can. Uh, no, I am. Um, uh, it's it's still uh, it's still a challenge. It still scares me. I still want to get it right. I still want to really want to be useful. Uh, and in this in the particular context in which we're uh, talking now, my work with uh, people who have aphasia uh, that that came last. You know, I'd been teaching for a good while before the invitation came uh, and before it ever occurred to me that, you know, I might have something to say uh, in a classroom full of folks uh, who were having, uh, who were having a, a constrained experience of language. So were you always a, a writer, a, a writer of uh, poetry? Did you always uh, uh, read it or, or do or like, or did you write it poems early in your, early in your, like in high school and stuff, were you, would you write poems then? I did, which I still don't understand why I did because I was such a terrible student and <laughs> I didn't read uh, very much. I, um, I read, I learned to read late. Um, they didn't call it attention deficit disorder when I was a kid. They just <laughs> said you had a lot of potential. <laughs> and um, apparently I had a lot of potential and I had very difficult time focusing. Uh, I guess it's worth mentioning that um, whatever I was going through, um, I, I medicated heavily for a while with uh, alcohol and drugs through my teens and into my early 20s. And that was an enormous distraction. And that also competed with my being able to... Uh, to follow through on any of my uh, desires to, to make art. And um, 
So uh, I, the first time I read a, a whole book for the pleasure of reading, not because I was assigned to, but because I, I just wanted to pick up a book and read a book, I was 17, which by a lot of people's standards is very late. It was, uh, I read uh, Dashiell Hammett's The Maltese Falcon, and I flew through it. And then, of course, I, you know, I'm walking around saying to people, like, have you, have you tried this reading business? This is amazing. I'm seeing, like, pictures in my head, you know, and um, the other adults were very patient. They were like, yes, we've, we've heard of books. Uh, there, there are whole rooms of them here at the school. You should, you know, anyway, so, but it took me a while. So, uh, so but I did uh, write poems in junior high. I managed to get one in the school yearbook. But that was sort of like a lark. I never, it never occurred to me that that would be something I would do. And into my early 20s, uh, I would occasionally go see a poet that came through town like you might go to a rock concert. I wasn't in the poetry community, but there were a handful of poets. One of them, there was a guy named Jim Carroll. Some folks might remember Jim Carroll. He wrote a famous book called The Basketball Diaries that was later made into a film with uh, Leo DiCaprio and but he was a poet and he'd been in punk rock bands and uh, uh, and I uh, and I would go see him whenever he came to town and, and would read his poetry and every now and then I would. But again, I didn't feel connected to it at all. I didn't um, I didn't come to poetry in earnest until I was about 27. I can tell you the month and year. Uh, it was <laughs> November of 1994. Uh, I. Uh, uh, I was in a cafe in London uh, with my father. And every day we had been going to a, a little coffee shop in the train station there at uh, Paddington Station. And there used to be a coffee shop there with a big window where you could see the train tracks and you could see the trains as they pulled in and you could keep an eye on the schedule board. Um, and we had been going there every day and sitting and writing. And my dad was working on a on an idea for a screenplay, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just I was just uh, sitting with him and uh, writing in a little notebook. And one day, I just sort of realized, oh, I've been doing this for weeks now, and what I'm writing, it's not a story and it's not a song. It seems to be sort of in between. And I kind of went, oh my god, I'm writing poems. I didn't. I mean, that's how you know, sort of disconnected I was from it. I didn't even know I was doing it. Uh, this is this is a good uh, uh, to go to the next slide. Uh, okay. But, but uh, uh, you know, when you, you know, you were doing things uh, when you're trying to get, figure out what you're doing, you know, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's to, that's the way it's supposed to be in your life to just, you know, go through and, 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 uh, you know, but you're always learning about things as you go. So but I think I'm always but, the uh, last person to, to know what I'm up to, you know, uh, you know, and I find that sometimes it encourages a kind of third person experience of your own life where I feel like, you know, as I scan my memories for the day, it's like going through surveillance footage and I'm like, what is he doing? And where is he going? And what's, you know, and uh, my relationship with, with poetry manifested in a way, it's almost like if you have um, uh, a child in your life, uh, you know, if you have a child or you know someone that has a child or you've seen a child in a museum, yeah. you know what I'm talking yeah. about, They're little tiny people. And, and, uh, um, uh, and one day you look at the child and you realize, oh, they're bigger. <laughs> now, it did happen before your eyes and while you watched, but somehow you didn't see the growing. You just looked one day and there they were, much, you know, much bigger, much, you know, uh, uh, much more themselves. And you're like, wow, you know, I, how long has this been going on? Okay. Let me go here. I'll be right there. So, uh, Roberta, we, there's a quote. Can you want, uh, read that? Yeah, I, I, when I was getting putting the, um, thanks Mark, I was gonna say, when I was putting the introduction together, I came across this quote from you, Brendan, that was from a 2013 interview. So clearly you were destined to be a person to teach 
poetry in to people with aphasia. And, and I just, I, I'm so glad that you, you said that quote, um, where you said, I began to write poetry in earnest without knowing it, that that's what I was doing. I realized one day that what I was writing was not a song, it was not a story, it was not interested in information, it was an emotional vocabulary. And just that concept of, you know, we're not concerned about the form, we're not concerned about the content, it's just, you wanna convey a feeling. And my goodness, mm -hmm. poetry is just, that's that's an amazing, wonderfully, amazingly wonderful combination for really playing with language and getting to enjoy language again. So I, we're destined to do this. I just wanted you to know that. Well, thank you. <laughs> I, I do think that uh, for the person who has aphasia, who wants to write, I do think that poetry may end up being a very good fit for you because it, um, it you know, and I, and I have to say that I, I am very aware of the limitations of my vantage point on this subject, because as much time as I spend with people who have aphasia, I will never know what your experience is like. Likewise, every experience of aphasia is unique. You know, there does not seem to be two identical experiences of it. All I can respond to is what I'm seeing. One of the things that I've seen is that most of the therapies that are available that are language-based for people with aphasia tend to be very corrective. And they tend to put an emphasis on creating familiar language uh, and using sort of familiar colloquialisms and language patterns. You know, one uh, example was a, was a worksheet I saw at one point back in 2017 where there was a drawing of a bed and under it, there was half of a sentence and it would say, when I'm tired, I go to my, and the person with aphasia was expected to fill out this worksheet and put in the word bed. Now, I suppose that's useful in a particular context, but I do know that when it comes to expressing yourself, poets have never been interested in the next indicated or predicted word. You know, uh, we want the word that is emotionally accurate. And that may not have anything to do with the facts. Uh, it may not have anything to do with information. If I can just tell you that I am happy or sad, you'll have that information, but you will never feel it with me. And usually when I'm telling somebody I'm happy or sad, what I really want to convey is how I'm feeling. In poetry, uh, by its very nature, cannot be ex as exact as, say, journalism. Because the whole game is about me trying to get you to feel what I'm feeling. And so the way, my way to do that is going to, you know, is, is going to uh, require that I draw on all kinds of things, some of which will make for very shaky grammar, you know, uh, simile and metaphor. I may need to find a particular rhythm. I may need to stay with an image. I might need to tell you something that is factually untrue to get at something that is emotionally right on the money. Um, and likewise, poetry is a discipline that is populated largely by people who have never felt they chose the right word. There is this sense through all poetry writing that you're never going to get there. I mean, the analogies that a lot of poets use are pretty various. One I like to use in the classroom is that it's like appraising diamonds. Uh, if you're a jeweler and you are appraising a diamond, you actually, and this is true, the jewelers use a scale where the perfect diamond is composed entirely of light. Uh, and everything that you can say about a diamond from that point is in the nature of a flaw. Right. So the jeweler knows they will never have a perfect diamond. It doesn't exist. You know, everything that, you know, their entire career is working with things that are just short of it. Likewise, the poet knows if I could write a perfect poem, it would be silent, it would be wordless, it would be going 
straight from my head into your head and you would have all of the associations with it that I have as well as your own. And it would be this, you know, and we're not, you know, so far we're not gonna get there. You know, the poet knows that it always, you know, that mortal self-consciousness can't be described. Uh, and the best we can do is sort of get close. If I, like I said, if I tell you I'm happy or sad, you'll have the info, but you won't have the information. But if I can give you a picture to see in your head that you recognize, a texture, a sense memory that you recognize, a taste in your mouth, a sound in your ear, a, a quality of light. You know, if I can give you a rhythm that feels natural to you, if I can, you know, if I can, uh, if I can cite something that you read as a child, whatever it is, then maybe you and I can begin to communicate on a much higher level. And here I feel as though the writer with aphasia is given a whole new toolbox, you know, uh, you know, to work with. And the more I, the more I followed this idea, the more I saw it borne out, because then I started to discover that there were all of these amazing writers that had aphasia who never talked about it. Uh, and who, you know, or who talked about it only in sort of, you know, quieter circles. And there's actually a great deal of poetry out there, poetry that is actively being studied right now in universities by people who are trying to get degrees in poetry. And it turns out it was all written by people who have aphasia uh, or had it at some point in their lives. And that there's, you know, that, it, that uh, they aren't, in other words, the writer with aphasia isn't somebody who's being allowed into poetry. They were part of the experience of poetry from the beginning, you know, from culture to culture. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, yes. Thank you. It, is it okay uh, if you want? Could you uh, share one of your poems and before and we, before we go to uh, a couple another? Uh, Let me find you a poem. Slide. Here. Okay. I'm trying to get out of the full screen mode here so that I can. There we go. So that I bring up my uh, poems here. Well, yeah. Here we go. See if I can find you a good one for this. All right, yeah, I'm gonna put one up on the screen. Okay, this one's kind of all over the place. And when I say all over the place, I mean it's literally sort of all over the page. But I'm gonna make it uh, nice and big if I can so that you can see it easily on your screens. This is a poem that uh, appears online at the Academy of American Poets. And the only reason I'm telling you that is in case you wanted to access it. Um, it's uh, at a site called Poem a Day. And the interesting thing about that site too is that it's a, it's a site that you can visit on your phone. It's a site that you can visit a variety of different ways. But if you do, um, this poem, uh, whenever you look at it online, might have a different shape. If you look at it on your phone, or you look at it on an iPod, or iPad rather, or you look at it in print, the lines are gonna be in, uh, in a different shape and it's gonna have a different look. And the line breaks will be at different points. Um, I discovered that later, but I was really kind of thrilled with it. Um, and the only other thing I'll tell you about this poem is uh, that, it's an example of some of the freedom, I think, that poets have, uh, the freedoms that I'm talking to you about today, uh, to sort of change the way language might uh, look. Uh, I've done a thing where I've arranged this poem entirely without punctuation. When I've started a new sentence, I've used capital letters, but I've also uh, spaced a lot of the thoughts out literally hitting the space bar on my keyboard six times in order to space certain things out. Uh, this idea of using all the available space on the page is not my idea. It's not a new idea. It's something that poets have been working with for a very long time. So if the poem looks strange to you, if you don't read that much poetry and you're wondering why is the language sort of spaced out like this, this is just an example of the kind of freedom that you would have as, as a poet, you know, if the thing that you wanted to convey to somebody was something that, you know, 
you know, would actually be held back by, uh, you know, by a familiar form of punctuation, or you wanted to control the, the speed at which the reader went through something, or you wanted the, the reader to only consider little pieces of language at a time, this is one way to do it. Uh, the only other thing I'll say about it is that it's a poem that's about um, trying to come up with the names for things. Uh, and, it's, uh, and it even comes from that frustration. So the poem is called, uh, uh, This Page Ripped Out and Rolled Into a Ball. This page ripped out and rolled into a ball. A rose by any other name could be Miguel or Tiffany, could be David or Vashti. Why not Aya, which means beautiful flower, but also verse and miracle and a bird that flies away quickly. You see where this is going. That is, you could look at a rose and call it, you see where this is going, or I knew this would happen, or even why wasn't I told? I'm told of a man who does portraits for money on the beach. He paints them with one arm, the other he left behind in a war. And so he tucks a rose into his cuff, always yellow, and people stare at it, pinned to his shoulder while he works. Call the rose Panos, because I think that's his name, or call it a chair by the sea. Point from the window to the garden and say, look, a bed of painter's hands. And this is a good place to remember the rose already has many names because language is old and can't agree with itself. In Albania, you say Trendafil. In Somalia, say Kake. In American poetry, it's the flower you must never name. And now you see where this is going. Out the window, across water, to a rose-shaped island that can't exist, but you're counting on to be there, unmapped, unmentioned till now. The green place you imagine hiding when the world finds out you're not who you've said. Thank you, you're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, um, so yeah, that's that's an example of one kind of poem. Of course, all my poems don't look like that. I mean, that's, uh, and that's another uh, thing that I like about poems and poetry is that they can be like dogs. Have you ever been to a dog show or seen one on TV? You know, and sometimes the winner is a little teeny tiny puffy thing, and sometimes the winner is huge and muscular and hairless. And as they all go by, you know, they're just going dog, 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 dog. You know, they're all dogs, and they look, you know, and they can look completely different from one another. And your poems can do that too. Some might be very compact and rhyme, you know, others uh, might be all over the page. I've seen poets you know, have half their poem upside down if they wanted to. Uh, thank you for sharing it. It's, uh, it's uh, trying to uh, name a word uh, in your poem that was, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, let me go back to uh, share my screen. And Um, so, uh, I've written two of your uh, books. Uh, one of us, uh, Bouncy Bounce, uh, and uh, the Bouncy Bounce uh, one fell down. Uh, so, uh, do you like do you like uh, un unpredictable uh, situations, uh, or do you like to try to orchestrate your whole life, or uh, uh, is there uh, something that you're scared of, uh, or you just don't care about it? <laughs> so, uh, um, good questions. Uh, well, 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I necessarily like unpredictable uh, situations. I mean, I, I think like probably most people here, uh, I sure would love to have been able to predict where things were going back in 2020. Um, <laughs> you know, and uh, you know, there's been, there's, there's been plenty of surprises. Um, as a matter of fact, I teach uh, high school and middle school, and uh, you know, uh, in the first year of the pandemic, uh, I had a middle schooler say to me, "I'm getting really tired of being part of an important moment in history." Uh, yeah. You know, and um, but I will say that the question about unpredictable situations resonates with me because I do, I do believe that the key to being a good poet certainly or a very useful tool for being a poet is to um is to be willing to be astonished all the time to be able to with some regularity look at the world around you and when i say regularity i mean like daily to to be able to catch your breath and look around and and wonder at how strange an unlikely uh, and beautiful and impossible the world is. And um, to sort of stop and remember that you're on a globe hurtling through space, that, um, you know, that the moon isn't an idea, you know, um, but that the moon we see at night looks exactly as it has for thousands of years, that the moon that we'll look at tonight looked that way for Cleopatra. It looked that way for the dinosaurs, except it might've been a little bit closer, but otherwise there are no new marks. Nobody's written Starbucks on the moon. It's, it looks exactly the way it did. There've been no visible changes. Um, that, um, uh, that, that you are part of that amazing and unknowable riddle. Uh, I believe in practicing a kind of childlike astonishment. You know, I'm always talking to my students about staying in that kind of mindset that you might have had at four or five years old. You know, the first time you watched a person get into an elevator and the doors closed, and when the doors opened again, five people got out, and you thought to yourself, ah, that's the little room you go into to turn into five people, you know? You cut your hair, more hair grows. You cut your hair, more hair grows. You cut your hair, more hair grows. Obviously, your head must be filled with hair. You know, why, uh, why do you never see elephants hiding in trees? Because they're so good at it. That kind of like, you know, just sort of playfulness. Um, and that's part of living in an unpredictable world, uh, but sort of rejoicing at it. So like I said, I don't know that I necessarily love unpredictable situations, but the world is unpredictable, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about it. Yeah. And I think so long as you're ready for that and you look for it and you're able to delight in it, that will only uh, strengthen your writing. Uh, I do try to control things, uh, uh, but I don't, uh, you know. Um, somebody once said, if you want to make God laugh, you should make plans. Um, you know, and then, you know, after you've made your plan, God will go, oh, really, that's how the day is going to end. Interesting, you know, and then do something else. Uh, but uh, I would also say that uh, you asked if there was anything that scared me. Well, I certainly touched on the fact that, you know, uh, teaching still scares me, which I think is good. Um, I don't know that it's something that I want to be complacent about. Um, you know, I had to teach a class today. Uh, my kids and I were looking at uh, uh, a piece of prose today. We were looking at a, at a beautiful story uh, by uh, a Portland-based uh, uh, writer named uh, Elida Thatcher, a story of, her, of hers called uh, The Bosendorfer. But the story has a love scene in it. And I really wanted the students to see this story and see how it was written. But I knew there was a love scene in it. And I didn't want to make anybody uncomfortable. And I can't tell you how much time I spent today just freaked out. You know, it started with the possibility of there being a slightly uncomfortable moment in the class and magnified in my head 
to me being chased through the woods with men that had dogs and torches, you know, uh, for, you know, uh, you know, and uh, having to sort of rein that in and, and um, uh, we got through it actually. We had a, uh, we had a great time uh, uh, doing that. Yeah, there's, there's, and, but I, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot that scares me. And, and uh, um, I also, I, I think it's important to, uh, to stay teachable. Um, that, uh, you know, a friend of mine says, you know, that, uh, you know, his philosophy is that he every day tries to put aside everything he thinks he knows about the world so that he can have a fresh experience of it. And that works for any individual discipline. You know, I try to put aside everything I think I know about poetry uh, so that I can have a fresh experience of it. And I believe that everybody has something to teach me. I used to think it was very important to have very militant ideas and say, you know, this is the good art over here and that's the bad art over there. This is the good music over here and that's the bad music. Here's the good movies, those are the bad movies over there. And if you're in the bad movie club, I'm not gonna talk to you. If you listen to bad music or you read bad poems, then I, then I have no use for you. And I realized that all I was doing was isolating myself, that everybody had something to teach me, that I could be surprised, you know, uh, by all kinds of work, and that even the things that, even the art and music and movies and what have you that might have bothered me or frustrated me, I realized that that even that frustration was a form of inspiration. Um, there was years ago a poet whose work I just I couldn't stand it, and it bothered me that other people liked this poet. I said, "What do you see in this work? I don't understand why you would read these poems." You know, why you would take the time to do this when you could like sit at home and just break your kneecaps with a hammer. Certainly that would be a better thing to do than reading, the, you know, this work. And then it hit me one day. Um, I, whenever I would encounter this poet's work, I would get so frustrated. I would write a poem about how much I didn't like that person's poems. Or I would write a poem <laughs> that tried to undo where they did in their poem. You know, if they... If they said something, then I would write a poem that said the opposite of what they said. And then I realized, oh, you think you're angry. What you are is inspired. This poet has sent you to the drawing board more consistently than any of the poets that you think are geniuses. You know, what I am is challenged. And, uh, and that's what's making me uncomfortable is that I'm being challenged. And that's a good thing. Like I should, you know, and now I look for this poet all the time. I can't tell you their name because I, you know, but, but um, just know that, you know, uh, that, you know, that, that, that was uh, an experience of mine and, and, you know, and one that was really useful. Uh, and, and I found that, um, you know, so, so just because something scares me isn't necessarily a reason to avoid it. You know, there might be something to learn there. The thing that's threatening me is that, you know, maybe my, you know, uh, my opinions are being challenged and, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, all, all uh, what you think is a, uh, you're going to uh, fail. Uh, you're always going to learn on everything that you, if you, every time that you can't do it, you're going to learn something else. So, uh, you know, that's what, that's the way I feel, uh, and but thanks. I'll go to uh, go to the next uh, slide, and then after that, if we could maybe go to uh, to your a couple of your poems again, and then maybe go to uh, uh, ask if there's anybody uh, has any questions. So let me go back here. And, uh, I have two two more uh, slides here, so. Uh, on uh, dementia, my darling. Uh, that is both your uh, book and also a a poem. Uh, this one, uh, you know, I, there's a song that they say, uh, "Hold this uh, thread as I walk away." Uh, I think that some people uh, right now, you're you're missing something you know, as, as, you're, as you're walking away. Uh, and, and also the song, uh, uh, Fred, Frank. Frank was uh, 
it was a it was a song that you knew about this song before you wrote yeah. this this poem. So uh, uh, if that was uh, if you that one uh, if you want to uh, talk about that that one if you like to. I've started doing some uh, workshops through a project called uh, the Alzheimer's Poetry Project, which is a really interesting project. If everybody's curious, a man named Gary Glazner started uh, this project. It was a way of teaching poetry workshops uh, to folks in elder care centers who were dealing with uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. And it was a way to write poems and listen to poems and to share poetry with people who were who were going through this. And uh, he taught me how to conduct a handful of these workshops and I started to do them. And I, I realized I really wanted to write about what I was seeing and what I was experiencing because my understanding of dementia was changing. And I, uh, I'd like a lot of people just thought these were people who had very simply uh, lost their memories. And what I saw was that's not actually what was happening at all. Um, that uh, their memories, they were having a sort of a, a constrained access to their memories. And sometimes it would seem as though their memory was sort of falling apart, but it would frequently pull itself back together and reassemble and, and fall apart and reassemble and fall apart. You know, sort of it would, it would pulse. And I thought, gosh, I want to write about this, but I'm also very careful. Uh, I, I don't believe that I can, uh, I think one of the worst things that I could do as a writer would be to appropriate somebody else's suffering, um, you know, uh, and uh, just for the sake of a good poem. And I've caught myself doing it in the past, you know, where I would hear a story on NPR or something about something that was happening in some part of the world. And I think, oh, I want to write about that. And the next thing I knew, uh, I was involved in this strange sort of theft, you know, uh, but I'd had, uh, but my parents, it turned out at the same time that I was doing some of this work, my parents had discovered uh, their own sort of concerns about uh, memory loss and the possibility of, of early onset uh, dementia, or what my father would call glitching, where things were starting to go missing in his memory. And he was, he was, he was having mild forms of aphasia, but also uh, trouble understanding the order in which things happened and forgetting things that happened very close, uh, very recently. And likewise, my mother was starting to get concerned. She'd had one or two episodes of aphasia where she had complete word displacement and, and thought, okay, is this gonna happen? And she talked to my sister and I, and she told us that there was a way she wanted us to handle it if it happened. Uh, that is to say, if she'd gotten so disassociative that she could no longer sort of find herself in her life, uh, uh, she told us how she wanted it to ha us to handle it. She, she actually said this, this sentence that ultimately became the basis of uh, the poem, Dementia My Darling. Um, and it was a poem I'd been working on for a while when I had dinner with Frank Wess, uh, the jazz musician. And um, it was towards the end of his life and he had just released a new album. And one of the tracks on there was a, was a piece called Dementia My Darling. And even at the time, I didn't see a relationship between that and the poem. I sort of filed it away. Um, it was, you know, after listening to that piece of music over and over, there was something that compelled me about it. And I realized, ah, okay, this is, you know, uh, these two sort of have a relationship uh, with each other. Uh, at least I felt they did. And uh, 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 so I, uh, so in a sort of a nod, a tribute to Frank West, I used his title uh, for this poem. I'll put the poem up on the screen. We'll go through it. Uh, like I said, I had noticed that um, um, what I was seeing of people with um, Alzheimer's was that their, the way their memory functions, the way their, uh, the order of their memories started to change and that there was this sort of pulsing nature to it, that sometimes it would it was intact and sometimes it would fall apart. And I thought, okay, I wanna to try to write in a way that emulates that. 
And then, as I said, my mother said this thing to me. And I realized if I used the words that she said to me, but I spaced them out on the page in such a way that before that sentence was through, I could have the sentence start to fall apart and put itself back together, sometimes in the wrong order. And that that might get me sort of close to the emotional experience I needed to have with the poem. And like, you know, we were talking about at the beginning of the interview today, that where it comes to the writer with aphasia, who is being subjected to therapies where a very specific word order is being emphasized, to know that in poetry, you're actually allowed to sort of rip language apart to its bare roots, to, I mean, literally to a sort of phonemic uh, basis, uh, that you have that freedom, that there's precedent for this, that this is something that, you know, uh, that uh, this is just one of the many uh, tools in the big toolbox of poetry. So uh, here's the poem. Um, I'm going to put this on the screen. This is Dementia, My Darling a poem made from lines spoken by my mother. If someone finds me on the road, if someone finds me on the road in my nightgown, barefoot and talking, in my nightgown, barefoot and talking, if my talking nightgown finds the road in me and someone on barefoot or I'm throwing my money to the cars, or I'm throwing my money to the cars, convinced I'm just feeding the ducks. Convinced I'm just feeding the ducks. I'm feeding the money, the cars, or the ducks. I'm just convinced to throwing. Please lock me away. Please lock me away and live your life and live your life and lock your life away. Please live me. If my talking convinced someone, my barefoot lock on the road, ducks in the cars throwing money to live and the feeding finds me and I'm me or I'm your life, please just nightgown away. Thank you for the snaps. Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you're uh, familiar with that. Everybody's uh, familiar with that. There's, uh, you'll see that sometimes at poetry readings. And now that we're all getting back together again, uh, if you go to a live poetry reading somewhere, you'll see people do that. You'll see them snapping instead of clapping. Uh, there's, there's a long history for that. And uh, there's, different, there's different sources on where that started. But in a number of states, including here in uh, California, it was illegal for a long time to read poetry in coffee houses. It was illegal until um, the middle 1960s because it was believed you wouldn't, it was, it, was, uh, it was asserted that you would have to have a cabaret license in order to, in order to offer entertainment like that. Uh, don't forget, this is also the state where it was illegal to play pinball until 1974. So, um, um, <laughs> The um, uh, so in order to sort of elude suspicion, uh, you know, if you were meeting at a coffee house or a church basement or what have you to read poetry, you would snap your fingers instead of clapping, and then the police wouldn't hear you or you know they wouldn't know that you were getting up to poetry in there. <laughs> All right, well I'll have to start doing that. Uh, here you go. I can do that. <laughs> Good. Uh, uh, could you uh, actually could could. Uh, do uh if you have another uh well actually we're getting a little bit uh a little later but if you want to do one more uh poem if you would like to uh, there's a poem that uh you were kind enough to mention from yes. uh, bouncy bounce and i'll put that on the screen that's um that's a poem called out in the air and i guess of the poems that i've had the privilege of sharing with you today this is yet another shape it's another kind of poem this is a little more prosy um, and, uh, I hope, uh, I hope it pleases, uh, I'd love to tell you all kinds of things about it, but I probably should just shut up and read the poem. It's called, it's called, uh, out in the air.
This is when I worry that I've left a faucet running and started a deluge that consumes my apartment. Is there such a thing as reverse arson, a name for someone who can't help but leave oceans in his path? I'm not like that, but people would have to call me something, an oceanist, worse, a mad oceanist. I don't hate anyone, not even the hateful. Most of the time, it's just fear, fear of losing or not getting, which is the same as drowning. Who investigates a suspected ocean attempt? Are there experts who know the signs, people who walk into a flooded house and point at clues, a ring of seashells under a bed maybe, and say, it started here. It's true, the world belongs underwater, and the part that isn't yet will be before this poem is truly old. If you weren't here right now, if I could sure you were out in the air, I would turn on your sink and bath, write the Latin names of fish on your bed, and watch the sun fall behind a bookcase. This is when I keep worrying, when you won't look up from what you're reading, and I'm so far from shore. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. You're very kind. You're very, uh, uh, this audience is making me feel like a million dollars. You know, uh, so, you know, uh, you're, you know, and if there's anybody there that's, you know, that, that actually didn't like the poems, you realize you're only encouraging me at this point uh, to go out and write more. <laughs> uh, so, you know. Um, you could always, you know, you could always put in the chat, just stop it, and I'll understand, you know, and I'll. <laughs> well, that, that's where it started. That's where it started. <laughs> uh, but uh, if we want to, uh, if anybody has any, any uh, comments, because on the last, uh, on the last uh, slide, it was basically if, if uh, people that, you know, any, questions or, or uh, you know, if anybody wanted to uh, help somebody that were starting uh, writing poems or like people that have, uh, you know, maybe older people, like I'm not saying I'm an old man. Uh, so if I start writing now uh, or other people that have uh, uh, a loss or something, would they start, uh, uh, writing what what would uh what would you tell them about okay well i just want to say i i do have time to stay late and i will i will hang on to, to talk about this uh but i thanks to anybody that may have to that may have to leave right yes. away i understand yes. i won't i won't hurt my feeling thank you for being here um i uh yeah my advice for anybody that that's looking to get started is to go ahead and give your permit yourself permission to go ahead and start and not be worried about whether or not you're qualified, whether or not you're any good, whether or not you can get anything published. None of that stuff matters. Um, you know, uh, the, the quickest and best way to write is to just write and trust, you know, if, you know, if for no other reason than there is a strange bald man here telling you, yes, you are allowed to write, you know, um, you know and you can go ahead and just jump in. Do not worry about getting anything wrong. Just go for it. Uh, that would be my advice. If you look at other people's writing and you find yourself going, well, I, I can't do what they do. The short answer is no, you can't. You can't do what they do. You're gonna have to do what you do because trust me, nobody else can do that. Uh, and one of the things that you touched on when you said, you know, if there's somebody who's older who's coming at this, I sometimes hear this from people, people who say that they feel that they've come to writing late, which to my mind is just, that is not true. That is, that is I don't care how old you are, you are not late. Uh, and here's why. Writing is very different than the other art forms in one major regard. There are no child prodigies in writing. Mozart, you know, arguably was writing complex pieces of music at six. But I tr trust me, if a six-year-old writes a novel, it's gonna suck. 
uh, okay? Because in I order to write, that. you need to have been somewhere. You have to have done something. You know, you need to have experiences. And the older you get and the longer you, you know, the longer you walk around this planet, the more stories that you will acquire and the greater your sensitivity will, will you know, will be enhanced. And um, uh, and so I feel like, you know, you know, the older you are, the more qualified you are to uh, to get out there and write, you know. But there are no baby Mozarts at our keyboards. You know, um, you have to at least have gotten old enough to have a couple of birthdays that were really disappointing. Uh, you know, um, you know, and many of us have that experience. I think at least by at least by 10 or 11, 12 or 13, you know, where, you know, you don't know what it was you wanted. You just know that you didn't get it. Mm. And, uh, you, know, <laughs> and uh, you know, and you got to start racking up those and you've got to have, I think, moments of real wonder and wonder where you were, you're aware that you're sort of bewildered and bedazzled by the world. And um, uh, so there's no such thing as starting late. When you start is right on time. Um, Raymond Chandler was born in, I think, 1889 and didn't get his first uh, story published in Black Mask magazine until like 1931. And uh, 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 the the uh, the big sleep I don't think appeared until like either 1937 or you know or later. Uh, so do the math. I mean, he was you know, you know, he was in his fifties before he would even start writing a genre of American literature that you know, or writing in a genre that would change American letters. You know, I mean, there's no such thing. You know, there's plenty of other writers that. Uh, you know, that have comparatively started, quote unquote, late, and have only gone to completely change the art form. Uh, you know, you, you know, so you're not late. Uh, you know, uh, all right, all right, good. I thought I was late. Sorry. No, you're not late. <laughs> okay. Right on time. Right on time. Okay. Yes. And uh, you have a question? Me? Uh, well, it's a yeah, comment. Yeah. And I wanted to uh, I've, I've noticed this with people with aphasia. They're so, many of them are so frustrated by not getting their grammar and their order of their expression right, that as magnificent as the vehicle of poetry is, they, it's sort of, you're suggesting that they unlearn or forget about the rules of grammar and syntax. Uh, is that accurate? And sometimes they're struggling with, I want to convey my thoughts according to the language I used to have. And now you're telling me with poetry, I don't have to. And sometimes they struggle and they self. Right. Uh, yeah, I would never want to tell you that the rules don't apply. What I, what I hope to emphasize though, when I'm working with folks in the classroom is that uh, grammar should not disqualify what you want to say, uh, the way you need to say it. And the way you need to say it uh, may not necessarily be a grammatically correct sentence. And again, this is not a, you know, a gratuity being paid to the writer with aphasia. Many of the great examples that we're looking at in poetry going back hundreds of years, poems that are, you know, that are revered for their assemblage. Uh, George Herbert's famous poem, Prayer, um, or the poem that supposedly is, you know, the big modern poem of the 20th century, In a Station of the Metro by Ezra Pound. These are both major poems that completely ignore subject verb agreement. You know, they don't, you know, and it was because the urgency of what they wanted to say, uh, you know, and how they wanted to say it and how they needed to say it, there was enough room in the language to allow, you know, that the language was elastic, bendable enough in poetry that you could go ahead and do that. Now, if you look for it, you will find examples of poetry in not just in English, but it, from all over the world, from different cultures, indigenous poetry, where the rules of grammar are very, very different, so as to be completely unrecognizable in Western terms where you'll see isolated words, 
you you won't see anything that works as sentence structure. And I do believe that because the motivations of poetry seem to be consistent from culture to culture, it's difficult for me to make the art. It's I think it's difficult to make the argument for cultural appropriation. If you say, well, there's an Urdu form of poetry that does it this way and a Chinese form of poetry that does it this way and an Arabic form of poetry that does it this way, you know, that the poet in English is allowed to borrow from all of these traditions because we were all after the same thing. Uh, we were all after this mode of communication through language um, that, uh, that, as Fernando Pessoa says, uh, functions against the true nature of speech. Um, uh, that in an effort to get at what he, what some have called the soul's ideal language, uh, the, uh, the poet has the room to be able to do this. So I'm not saying, you don't have to pay any attention to different to any rules and poetry has no rules. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that for the writer who has aphasia, uh, who is already contending with a great deal of constraint in their, in their writing and their phrasing, here's an art form where at least the rules are elastic enough, bendable, pliable, stretchable enough that you can still be writing poetry and communicating in a way that might seem much more freer, that might seem to be, uh, 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 you know, outside of the rules of uh, everyday grammar. <clears throat> so it's, you know, there's, I mean, it really is a question of you having more room to move. Um, you know, I work with an, a, a poet who has aphasia who was working on an autobiographical poem. And he looks at his aphasia as, and, and his life with aphasia, which has been pretty long now, as uh, an area in his life where what he's actually, he hasn't been afflicted with aphasia. He has been, he has been challenged to develop new skills. And those new language skills are specific to his condition. So that when he in his poem is talking about where he comes from, the fact that he is uh, uh, part, in, you know, part Native American, and he says at the opening of his poem, my mother was Comanche painting. She could speak with only birds. Well, that is, that is a sentence that would not survive an English comp class. In poetry though, it's perfect and it's a line or as close to perfect as we get, but I know it's a line of poetry that a lot of poets would kill for, you know, um, you know, and so, you know, and he has the freedom in poetry to communicate that way. It would never, it would never go down in a business letter, but he's got an art form here and he's got, but it, it is, I do realize that, you know, some of this might also come down to, uh, your taste. I mean, you know, not, you know, not everybody has the same experience of art and not everybody, you know, has, you know, uh, art doesn't necessarily mean the same thing to all people. I know from a teaching standpoint, I'm interested in whatever uh, gets the feeling out. And I do believe in expression for its own sake. Um, and, you know, that same poet I was talking about, Dale, Dale Benson, I don't think he'd have any problem with my saying, you know, telling you his name. Uh, when I asked him, look, you've got aphasia. Why on earth would you choose a language-based art form? Um, he took a moment and he said, to let me out. Mm. And that was, so clearly this was, this was, you know, this was the way that that was going to happen. Uh, you know, was, you know, that's what he, that was, that was the way that he felt that he could get out. And when you see Dale's poetry, it's, 
it's pretty astounding. And the same is true of, you know, I highly recommend if there's folks out there that are not familiar, I highly recommend a poet right now who still has a very active uh, uh, and uh, 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 how should I put it, um, consistent uh, aphasia would be, uh, uh, it's not really relaxing and remitting. It's it's um, you know she she is uh, she is at a she is at a level of constraint right now where her ability to parse and pull up the language that she needs, um, you know, is uh, 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 she contends with a with a with 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 a series of of. Uh, uh, sort of cognitive obstacles that don't seem to be going anywhere. Her name is Eloise Klein Healy. And I highly recommend her book, Another Phase. I knew Eloise for years before she had aphasia and she was a much cherished and respected poet here uh, in Los Angeles, uh, whose lectures on prosody uh, and the dynamics of formal poetry were just, you know, stunning, breathtaking lectures. And um, then she got encephalitis ran an insanely high fever and on the other end of it had this enduring uh, uh, combination of paraphasias. And um, she said, I'm not gonna stop writing. I refuse to stop writing. And um, she started to work with a therapist, a lady named Betty McMicken, who was helping her with a variety of different things. And one of them, she said, well, you know, uh, with writing, why don't you just try for five lines? You know, instead of writing long, you know, instead of setting out to write a big expansive poem, I'm limiting you to five lines. You get to write, you can write five lines. That's what you're going to start with. And she began to write poems that were only five lines. And she's writing in a different style and she has a different voice now as the result of aphasia. She's not trying to recapture the old voice at all. This is a new phase in her life. And the aphasia is absolutely contributing to how she chooses words. And, uh, and she has a whole new relationship to language. And she regards these as strengths. And you'll look at some of the poems, and in some, in some poems, she is absolutely paying attention to grammar. And others, she's decided, it's not that she's ignoring grammar so much as looking at a poem and going, you know what, this poem works better if I don't bother with punctuation. Or this poem works better if I capitalize each first letter. Or this poem works better if the first four lines are together, but the last line is separated. And she knows that in poetry, she has the freedom to do that. You know, uh, her, her latest book of poems is called Another Phase. Uh, and uh, it's a gorgeous manuscript. It came out in 2018. I know there's another book on the way. Uh, she's not slowing down, uh, you know, uh, and they're all good. And she writes about she writes about having aphasia. She writes about uh, all kinds of things, you know, all the things that a poet might want to write about their life, their loves, uh, the phenomenal world, uh, you know, what the dog got up to, uh, but also what's going on in her mind and in her heart. Uh, there's a question. Uh, Maria, you have a question? Sorry. To... Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Lovely. Okay, I'm going to take my time with this uh, because I don't want to get it wrong. Huh. A thing that causes me anxiety in poetry is, and I can give an example, I can't remember the name of the writer, but I read a poem where the poet had taken a news article of the um, killing, hanging, of somebody who had um, apparently committed a crime, but it was suspected that um, they were beaten into a confession, but that person had learning difficulties. And that poet wrote in the voice of that person with learning difficulties. Mm. And when I read it, I was appalled um, and it's, approaching work like that where I feel um, completely affronted by the fact that somebody would do that, that somebody would try to habit that very real scenario that has affected a family. Um, 
how do we deal with things like that uh, and not run screaming from poetry or reading? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I absolutely hear you. And there's, you know, this, this kind of, uh, this kind of thing seems to sort of make its rounds. Um, in other words, you know, I, I remember when I started to write poetry in earnest, I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by some pretty tall trees. Uh, uh, other poets, you know, who would say things like, look, the controversies in poetry are going to go by like buses. You can get on one now or you can wait 15 minutes and there'll be another one by, uh, you know, and, uh, and there are things that seem to come up. The whole question of whether or not poetry matters seems to come up on a cyclic level. And this question, I'm not diminishing what you're talking about, but this does seem to come up with some regularity is that we will see an example of poetry, usually a poem in print somewhere, where somebody has taken the voice of somebody else, uh, somebody from another culture, somebody, uh, you know, or somebody who is the victim of, uh, of an atrocity or, uh, or some catastrophe, and decides, well, I'm gonna write in their voice. Uh, when I started writing poetry, there was a, there were a couple of major crimes in the news uh, where uh, uh, a woman, uh, a couple of women, uh, went and drowned their children, and uh, you started seeing poems about this popping up at uh, coffee houses, and people writing in the voice of the woman, people writing in the voices of the children, uh, and uh, there was, you know, and and I, you know, I honestly. I've never known what to say or how to feel about it because on the one hand, you know, I, I do believe that, you know, you, all of you as writers uh, are allowed to write about whatever you would like to write about. And I would never, you know, I, I would never say you can't write about a thing. Uh, writing about a thing and publishing about a thing uh, are two different things though. Um, and what we're really talking about, or at least it seems to me in the context of this conversation, one way we could look at this is not so much whether or not somebody should be allowed to write at such a thing, but what went on to that being published and put, it, put out into the water supply. Because of course, most poets begin not writing for other people, they're writing for themselves. Um, you know, I saw an interview, I was actually present for an interview with Maxine Cuman, where she was asked, how long have you been a poet? And she said, well, wait a minute, a public poet or a private poet? Because privately, I've been a poet a lot longer. And this was for me. A public poet, when you start sharing your work with the outside world, you know, and that's really all that changes is that you've decided to go public and show it to other people and start publishing it. Then, you know, it, you, then you could say a different set of rules might apply. Uh, what you put out into the world uh, and what you ask people to pay attention to. Um, that's, you know, and that's going to come down, I think, to your own heart. Uh, I know that, you know, I've certainly come across plenty of poems like the ones you describe and just think, wow, you know, I don't want to read this. And I, you know, it makes me uncomfortable imagining somebody writing this kind of thing. Um, but I get scared, of, you know, at the point that, we, that I would say, well, that should be illegal or you shouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, I do think it's interesting though that something like that got published because now there's an editor in on it, if not a whole editorial board in a magazine or a journal who got behind that and said, you know, okay, so not only did the poet decide, okay, I'm going to put this out into the world and I'm going to either speak for the dead or I'm going to speak for the oppressed or I'm gonna, I've set myself up as that voice and I'm gonna do it. I think I have something unique to say about that. But then there's this whole other group of people that said, you know, we're gonna do that too. We're gonna to, we're gonna get behind this. I don't I don't know what you do. I mean I I really don't know. Uh, uh, I'd certainly be interested if anybody else here in the group wants to weigh in on that one. Uh, you know, because uh, that's I mean and I think that's what you do with a subject like this. You know is you open it up to the world and say, you know, how do you feel about it? Uh, personally, it's not a poem I would go to, you know, it's not, uh, it's, I'd be, you know, and I've started to write poems like that. I, do, I have had, I have caught myself going, oh my God, what an amazing image, you know, uh, and I can tell you what happened. I ended up writing a poem about wanting to write a poem about something. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I'd heard a story um, about the uh, drug wars in Juarez and how children in Juarez, Mexico were struggling to uh, reconcile this experience. And uh, a commentary on NPR said that the children of Juarez had run out of red crayons. And I thought, oh my God, that is such an amazing thing to say, you know? And right at that moment, I had completely dehumanized the situation. As a poet, I was thinking, what an amazing image that is. Not, oh my God, this is terrible. Thousands of people are being murdered. And I caught myself trying to come up with a way to write about it in a poem. And I thought, wow, what are you doing? You know, you, you know, whoa, you're, there's, there, there are people's lives here, you know? Um, and so I wrote a poem in which I sort of went after myself and said, you know, this is, this, this is one of the worst things you can do. Uh, you know, uh, because I thought, you know, you get, you, you know, and so that was, and that was as close as I could get to that particular subject was to, you know, uh, one other time, and again, I, I'm not saying, I mean, you are absolutely all welcome to disagree with me, and you certainly don't need my permission to do so. Um, uh, years ago, I did write a poem about Emmett Till, uh, the, uh, uh, the young uh, 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 black uh, uh, boy who was uh, murdered by uh, a group of men in the latter 50s. Um, and, uh, I did write about that particular, um, the tragedy and, and again, at the time, uh, I felt that, uh, what I wanted to talk about was how indescribable that thing was and that there was no getting close to a subject like that, that you couldn't, that in order to want to write about a thing, you were like that, that you know, there was, that there might not be a way to do it. Uh, and so I, I tried to write about it using the language of cosmology, uh, the language of uh, planets and, um, and solar systems, uh, and sort of coming at it as though the whole tragedy itself was something on the order of the, the principle of gravity itself, that it was so massive, so huge, that there was no way to get to it. Uh, and, um, uh, and that was as close as I could get. I think this is the two times that I've like looked at a, at a tragedy and thought, okay, I, something in me needs to respond to this, but I also, I have to be very careful about how I do that because, you know, at any moment I can cross a line into appropriation here. And it's one thing I think, you know, to, to write, to write in a particular style, but to, but as I said, to, appropriate somebody else's uh, uh, whole life is, I, I, personally, I can't get there. Maybe you can get there though. I mean, again, I, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I'm, I'm always terrified of doing anything that will um, stop somebody from writing something that they need to write. Again, the difference is, do you put it in the water supply? Do you go out and publish it, you know? Uh, I mean, how many pictures do you have on your phone right now that might have somebody in them who did not give you your, their consent to take their picture? You know, I mean, did you take a picture of something in a restaurant? Did you take a picture of, people, of something on a train or out in public? And I can have those pictures on my phone and I can look at them. Have you ever walked through a photograph uh, where somebody was getting their picture taken at a tourist site? You know, like, and you're like, oh shit, you know, and you, you know. And have you ever wondered that, like, maybe you're in their scrapbook at home? You know, uh, <laughs> I've never liked a single picture that was ever taken of me, but I'm convinced if there is a good picture, it's in a scrapbook in Kyoto. You know, <laughs> and it's a picture that I walked through at Disneyland. And every now and then a family looks at it and goes, who is that guy? I don't know, but he's very handsome. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, um, but if they go ahead and publish that picture, then I get to say, uh, uh, well, hmm, you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well, yes, you can publish that one. I only have two chins in that one. Uh, so. All right. Well, well thank, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you for uh, everything that you're, 
that you uh, talked about and, and uh, sharing. And uh, so uh, thank you for all the time that, uh, you know, we went a little bit further than usual, but, uh, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, was here. Uh, 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 Roberta, you're, uh, you're muted, Roberta. Thanks. I was going to say no particular questions in the chats, but everybody was just thanking you for a really, a really wonderful presentation. Yes. Um, and Brendan, I also I I got El Eloise Klein Healy's name in the chat, but there was the other poet. I, I missed his name, and I wanted to put it in the chat. Um, the the gentleman that you mentioned first, in case other people want uh, to. Dale Benson. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, let me see here. I might have a. Let me see if I have a, a link to uh, uh, a poem. Uh, 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 let me see if I have this link. Uh, Where's the link? I'm going to say good uh, for uh, we're going to stop the guilt being live and we're going to say okay. goodbye to everybody okay. and then we can uh, but thank you everybody I'm going to stop uh, yes uh, live right now thank you uh, thank you.